Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be continuing our journey through Season 10 and trying to untangle the absolute web that is the TV version with its countless remixes from the book. Now that we are creeping ever closer to the Whisper War proper, the TV version will take a pretty major swerve. So as is very much trend at this point, we will be jumping around between the two versions quite a bit just to keep things, well, as organized as they can reasonably even be anymore. All that said, let us not waste any more time and dive right in. And luckily for me, the first thing we'll cover today is somewhat consistent between both versions, and that is Negan's biggest fanboy, Brandon. In the book, after the newly established military, with even Gabriel among its ranks, have finished their exercises, we see Rick making his way back into Alexandria, which is exactly when our parasocial Andy decides to strike. Do keep in mind that both of Brandon's parents have now died. So if he was already a loose cannon with the whole shovel incident, then now he has very much gone off the deep end. He attacks Rick, knocking him to the ground and repeatedly punching him. Rick, obviously realizing that he isn't exactly thinking straight, just asks, you done? But of course, this is Brandon. So he just screams that he'll kill him and whatnot, but is promptly bonked by Rick who is finally done with this nonsense. And at this point, the roles are very much reversed. With Rick now being the enraged one and saying that his stupid parents tried to kill Maggie and then him, not to mention Brandon himself going after Sophie and Carl. So yeah, at this point, Rick is very much in his Shut up. sort of thinking. I mean, you know, Rick is basically like, come on, I gave you so many chances, can you please just relax? Though overhearing their whole kerfuffle, Michonne runs up, but Rick says that it's just fine. Finally, turning to Brandon and saying that Maggie is leaving today and that he better be on that caravan. Finishing by saying that if he's not on it, well, he'll just put a bullet in him. Yet again, throwing in a little F-boy in there because Rick is very much channeling his inner Negan for a little while now. Big surprise, Brandon then very much does not go on the caravan, yoinks the keys, frees Negan, and that is the end of that. As for the show, we do have Brandon who has appeared all of three times, but instead of freeing him, he just pops up and becomes his biggest fan. Later, we of course find out that it was Carol who freed him, but more on that later. Though before we continue with the differences, which there are many, I think this whole freeing Negan debacle and basically everything surrounding that is a perfect case of the fragmented story that are seasons 9 through 11 and why I often describe them as just a bit of a mess. I mean, we still have the comic story, right? Brandon might not be the one to free him, but they still meet up and they then head off to meet the Whispers with seemingly the same goal. But the thing is, in the comic, we saw how that hatred slowly but surely brewed. Starting with them already bullying Sophia, then the Carl incident happened, then they tried to go after Maggie, then Rick, and now he just goes off the rails. And he hasn't even been around for long in the comic either. But just like I mentioned last time, each and every one of these moving pieces directly contribute to the next big climax. Every single one of these little outbursts of his are connected. Again, it is about actions and the consequences of said actions. In the show, on the other hand, we get some throwaway lines about how his parents died during the Savior War and how he hates Rick. Which is like, okay, that was seven years ago and Rick is supposedly dead. And almost as if they realized that they didn't quite have enough dirt on him yet, we are then conveniently introduced to this little boy and his mother who Brandon ends up killing. Which is like, what? I didn't mention this before, but there's also the whole thing of Negan throwing Margot against the wall and killing them, protecting Lydia. It's just like the rioters were so, so desperate to make Negan look like a good guy that they just throw in like five extremely obvious instances of, hey, look at this, he's doing the right thing, right? He's beating up bullies. He just comes off as very desperate and rushed. Like, let's be honest here, Brandon is literally the most hateable character of all time, but he is also not an organic one. Nothing about his appearance makes sense in the bigger story. There was already a savior uprising way back in season 9 when Rick was still around. Yeah, he would have been a lot younger back then, but I mean, why didn't we see anything there? And to further illustrate what I mean, let us get back to the book. While Maggie's caravan rides off, Brandon yoikes a whole bunch of supplies and they head to the border. But as soon as they reach it, Negan stabs him and that is the end of Brandon. There is no sob story about a whole different kid or anything. It is literally just Negan realizing that Brandon will get everyone killed and he just puts him down then and there. And don't forget, this is a big deal for Negan. Kids for him are a huge sore spot. Brandon was just completely out of control and again was trying to purposely incite a war. Something that this whole mission of his was trying to avoid. Once again, we loop back to the whole people are a resource and all that. But anyway, I don't want to go off on a 20 minute rewrite tangent, and we will also be talking about this whole hero's journey sort of storytelling we see in the TV version, so that's where I'll leave that for now. 
And if you remember what we talked about with the whole pacing of the season, it's things like these that on paper make it seem like the season is moving very, very fast. In the show, Brandon is literally just a rando that pops up and dies almost immediately instead of being a constant thorn in Rick's side. So that entire portion of the story is literally just not there in the show. That said, in both versions, now wandering around solo, Negan runs into Beta, or as he's more commonly known as, Frowny McTwo Knives. And don't forget, in the comic, this is the first time we're meeting him. So someone lumbering over even the absolute unit that is Negan is, you know, quite spooky. And yes, I also have another small nitpick. When we followed Negan's little journey here, it was cool to see the small town and how run down it was now that we are three-ish years into the apocalypse. Whereas in the show, it is, well, just another forest. But I digress. There are also some minor differences in how Negan carries himself in this first encounter. With the comic version, walking a very, very thin line between the ha ha you're frowning McTwo knives and the I will bash your head in version of Negan. The show on the other hand just takes what I think is a more grounded approach of Negan being far less combative. Also, the way he ends up meeting Alpha is a little different. In the comic, basically right away, he is led directly to her where he announces that he is in fact in love giving us what is a classic Kirkman cliffhanger to very much stew on. And also Kirkman later did apologize saying that, yeah, I did sort of mislead you on purpose, like this whole I am in love thing, yeah, that is something Negan would say. But at the same time, with the cover we'll talk about in just a second, yes, he was very much baiting us. The show, on the other hand, plays their whole meeting just a tad bit differently, with Negan first having to go through bait up and then the whole whimsical trial, etc, etc. And more on this in a minute. On the opposite side of the conflict, however, we have some huge, huge remixes. Many of which stem from, say it with me now, the time skip after Season 9. Much of the immediate TV story revolves around finding Alpha's Horde, with Daryl and Carol going off on their own little adventure in hopes of tracking down the Whispers. I know some people are really annoyed by the storyline as, let's be honest here, Carol is making reckless decision after reckless decision. But for me personally, that's not even my biggest issue with it, as I think it's perfectly in character considering everything she's been through. Okay, minus the random time skip after which she suddenly returns with a vengeance, I guess. What more so sticks out to me is that, one, it just feels incredibly meandery, but number two, and for me this is far more important, I think it completely misses the point of what the Horde in the comic was even meant to be. By design, it was something that we literally could not do anything about. It was almost a force of nature looming over this entire arc, and is exactly why Rick started jumping through these hoops to trick his own people into not revolting. Every single thing happening in the comic is currently with just one very simple and explicit goal. Do not mess with the Whispers. Plain and simple. And that is also exactly what makes Negan's escape such a huge deal, because they literally don't know what he's going to do. Rick had talked about the Whispers a whole bunch to him, so technically, he should know where the border is, and Alpha made it very, very clear that crossing the border is an act of war. At this point, we are rapidly approaching another convergence point that will spark war. The show, on the other hand, even going as far back as Season 9 with Daryl already clashing with Beta, I think has already desensitized the whole conflict with the Whispers. So at this point, it is just sort of another enemy. And now that we have Carol and Daryl quite literally trying to find the Horde, to me at least, it sort of undermines the unprecedented power that the Whispers wield. If I could put it in a more abstract manner, and bear with me here, I think it'll make sense. In the book, it felt like we are just adventurers in a classic RPG. We are nobodies, and we are simply trying to traverse the many challenges of this world. The show, on the other hand, really feels like Daryl and Carol are the heroes of the story, and no matter how impossible the odds, they still face them head on. The grit, the danger, and the grounded aspect of the comics is just not there for me. And to sort of illustrate what I mean by that, in the book, we see Rick trying to keep Negan's escape a secret, and so he sends Michonne and Aaron after him. They find Brandon's corpse at the border, then they try to play wingman for each other, and eventually make it to where Negan ran into Beta. And just like with Negan, they are quickly surrounded by walkers and whispers alike. Michonne tries calling out to them saying that they are simply looking for a dangerous prisoner. But Beta very much deals in absolutes, and says that the rules were very clear, you do not cross the border. And moments later, Aaron is promptly stabbed by Beta. So these incursions aren't just fun times with Daryl and Carol as they banter around and whatnot. We don't cross into their land like three separate times. The moment we do, every single walker is a Schrodinger's walker, and the moment said Schrodinger's walker turns out to be a whisperer, well, 
All bets are off. And before we pick back up with Aaron, who's taken one of Mach 2 Knives' infamous strikes, let us jump on over to the show where Aaron has in fact not been stabbed, but we have yet another case of what to me undermines the core mystery of the Whispers. Gamma. I've touched on this before already, but to me, Gamma always felt sort of crowbarred in as another surface level, hey look, not all of them are bad type of character. Something that I don't think was even necessary considering we already have Lydia. I guess the argument there is that it's another named Whisper, but then again in the show we also have the likes of Dante. So yet again, if you do the whole spy storyline, you do the whole traitor storyline, you do the whole oh hey she's not actually evil storyline, I mean we sort of already have all that. But anyway, in story we just see Aaron and Gamma try to get to know each other and glean some information about each other's communities. And like I also said last time, I do think this was just a case of Ross Marquand, I don't know how to say his name, I'm sorry, just needing some sort of story to keep the actor around. So this, I think, is just what made sense for him. Aaron was a recruiter, so that's what he does. He tries to recruit her. As for Gamma, as with many, many things in these later seasons, when taken in isolation, yeah, her story is interesting and worth exploring. But in the bigger picture, it just seems redundant and only harms the overall intrigue of the Whispers. To me, the sort of fog of war we see in the books ever since Alpha's border and just not knowing about anything what they're doing or planning was incredible. I mean, keep in mind that our next meeting would be a declaration of war. In the show, we've already met Alpha like five different times. And so the show to me just felt like it completely demystified it and replaced it with what I think is meaningless action. Personally, I think they just seriously overcorrected the excruciatingly slow burn that was the lead up to All Out War. So in essence, all but officially, we were at war right away. The one thing I will admit is an absolutely incredible addition that finally sees its climax is the whole Sadiq Dante storyline that had been brewing for the whole season. I think I've spent enough time praising the absolutely terrifying insidious threat that is the constant sabotage we see from Dante. So for the sake of time, I won't rehash all that again. But episode 7, once again directed by everyone's favorite ginger Michael Cudlitz, is easily one of my favorites of the season. Just seeing that moment where everything finally clicks in Sadiq's mind is just… yikes. And of course, there is a conversation to be had around the whole, Carl saved Sadiq and now Sadiq also just dies unceremoniously barely two seasons later. And while I do agree to an extent, I also think that's kind of falling into the sunk cost fallacy. Giving Sadiq eternal plot armor just because Carl saved him is sort of silly to me. And instead of focusing on Sadiq, sort of just breaks me back to the eternal question of what was the point of killing Carl in the first place? But okay, let's be honest here, I've already spent an ungodly amount of time talking about that. So taking this in isolation, if I've been saying that much of the Whisper story in the TV series was sort of undermined and demystified, then the entire Dante reveal is the exact opposite. It perfectly captures the spine-chilling thought that Alpha single-handedly infiltrated the fair, yoinked a dozen different people, and is clearly now attempting to whittle down our forces through sheer attrition. So while I would have loved to see all the infighting that we see in the book, I would still say that this was easily some of the best stuff in the season for me. Jumping back on over to the book, following Beta's stabby stabby times, Michonne pops off and starts curing them one after another. Though naturally, she is soon overwhelmed and knocked to the ground. But just when Beta is seconds away from finishing her, gunfire erupts and the whispers are sent scattering. And yeah, this is an odd one for me. Functionally, obviously this is meant to be a declaration of war, with even the title of the issue, Tip of the Spear, being a phrase to describe first soldiers moving into a war zone. But in-universe, this is a bit of a TV moment for me, because Dwight's sudden appearance here does seem to be a case of good old teleportation. Obviously, we don't know how long Michonne's battle lasted and where they were positioned originally, but them just suddenly popping up does seem awfully convenient. But okay, my nitpicks aside, they bandage up Aaron and insist that Michonne ride to the hilltop right away, saying that Aaron might just bleed out otherwise. The militia, on the other hand, would press further into enemy land. So yes, at this point, as Dwight himself acknowledges, this is an act of war. And speaking of spooky times ahead, we cut back to Alexandria where Andrea has finally made it home. Keep in mind that she left with Carl and Lydia as soon as Rick broke the news of the border. So at this point, she is completely in the dark about all the recent developments that have happened with Alexandria. And so, as she makes it past the gates, she sees the countless giant silence the whisper signs spray painted all over the community. 
Enraged by this complete 180 in how they live and operate, she goes right on over to Rick, barging through the doors and telling him to immediately get those signs down before things get out of hand. Though as she does, she notices Rick's face, which has now been put through quite the ringer, immediately turning her anger into fear and worry. Rick then catches her up on everything that happened, and naturally, there is a lot of mixed emotions there. On one hand, Andrea is right there by his side. I mean, he was attacked in their own home. So now that his closest advisor is finally back, they both put their heads together trying to figure out just what to do next. But at the same time, just like we've seen many times before, she is also there to challenge Rick's views when she believes him to be drifting away from their core values. As much as she understands his move, she is still alarmed by Rick's decision. She even says outright, So, you're manipulating them? Do you realize how much like Negan you sound right now? And again, to me personally, this entire in the eye of the storm leadership angle just seemed so, so much more enticing than the Rambo duo of Daryl and Carol running around the woods in search of Alpha. The comic Rick is very much tainted by everything that has happened to them. He is deliberately channeling the hatred of their communities, and his strong sense of what is right and wrong is slipping. Even the whole silence the whisper signs. In the book, these are literally calls to action. They are almost war cries telling the communities to band together against a greater foe, all instigated by Rick himself. In the show, on the other hand, the signs are painted by Dante, which to me just takes the agency away from the leaders of the communities and them managing this extremely dangerous weapon that is raw hatred. It feels like the show just took the safe way out of... Well, Carol did lose another kid, so she'll now go on a warpath, and that's about it. There really is no ambiguity there whatsoever. If anything, I think the closest thing we got to this was Michonne being apprehensive toward the collaboration with other communities back in Season 9. But I mean, that too quickly went up in smoke. So again, if I use the whole RPG metaphor, the comic feels like Rick's morality is sort of dipping into the villainy. Whereas the TV version is, again, just a hero's journey of Carol going against the big bad. But anyway, cutting on over to Negan, in both versions we see some funny goofy times as he gets acclimated to the Whisper's way of life. Only in the comic, it's kind of posed as him having a whole bunch of fun, as opposed to the TV show where it was a genuine challenge. It doesn't really change anything in the grand scheme of things, it's just a slight thematic difference in how the Whispers treat him initially. Same goes for Beta, who is certainly annoyed by Negan, but it feels a bit more played up for the show. As in the comic, he just very quickly got to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with Alpha herself. And oh boy, this is another one of those times where I have to bring up being in the community when the comics were originally coming out. Because when the cover art for King and Queen came out, many a theory was certainly brewing. Admittedly though, even back then, many absolutely nailed the prediction that Negan is just going to solo Alpha. But there were also certainly a whole bunch of theories about them joining forces, getting the saviors who, don't forget, are leaderless at the moment, and then marching on the joint communities yet again with Negan at the helm. So yes, this was certainly a fun time to be in the community. Though differences-wise, the whole Alpha stuff plays out largely the same following this point, except the kissing scene which I won't even show because I think YouTube will blast me, but like, no, I don't even want to look at it, so I don't even care about YouTube blasting me, I just don't want to look at it while editing this video, so no, it's not gonna be there. Though saying that, while the macro story is largely the same, the details around it differ an absolute ton. As dictated by my highly scientific charts, we have about 30 other stories to get to beforehand. So if in the comic, from this point on, it is full-blown war, then the show still has a whole list of things to happen beforehand. Like, for context, Negan reaches the Whispers in episode 6, but ends up killing Alpha in like, what, episode 12? In the comic, though, he arrives at their camp, and the next issue, Alpha is dead. That's it. So for simplicity's sake, let's just get through the book first. Negan notices a woman being, for YouTube's sake, I will call it attacked by two whispers. Obviously, we already know Negan's stance on this, so he immediately pops up and tries going after them. Though Beta then steps in and swats him out of the way, saying that this is their way of life and that he shouldn't be protecting the weak. Effectively saying that it goes against the natural order of things where the strong would prey on the weak and either turn the weak into strong ones or just drive them out completely. Though at this point, Negan very much drops the act, asking, are you seriously going to allow something like that? But again, he is promptly shut down. And it's then that we cut to him, sleeping alone, clearly still absolutely enraged, and calling them the weirdest weirdos ever. And it's here where things get very, very interesting. 
because Alpha then approaches him to talk about what happened, basically echoing the same thing. Protecting the weak will never make them strong, etc, etc. Though as much as Alpha tries talking about how yes, they are animals and that civilization is a myth, Negan calls her out, largely repeating the same thing he told Rick. There are so many thems out there to unite against. Why wouldn't you protect your own? And here, Alpha cracks, clearly thinking of Lydia. They actually have a surprising heart-to-heart -heart here, but as we all know, Negan is as much conniving as he is charismatic. So, as soon as Alpha has well and truly dropped her guard, he goes in with the knife, and that's the end of Alpha. And oh boy, is there a ton to unpack here. First off, having the leader of a main antagonist community just randomly taken out in such a manner just completely blew the roof off of any story arc so far. Especially with it happening in issue 156, not even around number or the anniversary of The Walking Dead or anything, it is just a random issue. One page Alpha is alive, the next she is dead and Negan is talking about how Rick will be happy when he sees this. So again, unlike the show where we've already had countless skirmishes with the Whisperers, as soon as Michonne and the others stepped into Whisperer land, literally the following issue, everything blows up in spectacular fashion and the leader of the Whisperers falls. Though secondly, there's the Negan angle to talk about. For simplicity's sake, we will talk about it a whole bunch when we actually get there, but Negan would turn out to be just Carol's agent, right? Well, in the book, there is none of that. He does this entirely of his own volition. There is no promise, no agreement, nothing. He is freed by Brandon, he kills Brandon knowing that whatever he did next would inevitably lead to something very, very bad, and then goes undercover to Solo Alpha, clearly thinking it would buy him favor with Rick, and to bring back something that would instantly calm the community down, because I mean, hey, we've taken out their leader, right? Even on a symbolic level, Alpha infiltrated them and took 12 hens. Well, Negan responded in kind. Also keep in mind that when Negan met Rick, he immediately said that he is off-limits because he doesn't want to create a martyr. Well, with the Whispers, things are very different. He knows they live like animals, and their entire hierarchy is literally based off of taking out the upper rank. With the exception of Beta, there is no unity among them whatsoever. Not only that, there is an explicit line in the issue where one of the Whispers is impressed by Negan taking on two walkers alone. Yes, he is impressed because Negan took on two walkers. He instantly knows that a vast majority of them are not fighters. So with all that in mind, he takes out the brains of the operation. Get it? Brains because the head. He then lets Beta just go nuts trying to muster up their forces, and then they just have to deal with good old predictable walkers. Obviously much of that would still go haywire, but absolutely all of this is purely his own idea. As to which version you prefer is up to you. Clearly TV Negan and Comic Negan are largely two different characters at this point. But for all of you TV onlys, just know that in the books, Negan has literally never changed. He is the same exact dude he has always been, and being defeated by Rick just forced him to realize that there is even greater potential in banding together against a them instead of leading purely through fear. Which, by the way, is another interesting parallel, with Alpha and Beta doing exactly that. Both of them lead through fear, something that Negan already knows Rick and the joint allies beat back once. Also, there were many theories about Negan returning to Alexandria and eventually taking over there because he would now be their savior, but let's not get to that now. At this point, Negan with Alpha's head over his shoulder just begins to make his way back to where we saw Dwight and the militia. And with that, a war has well and truly started. As for the TV version, we have a few more things to tackle before we get to Negan becoming the usurper. First of which being Virgil. No, of course not the ultimate mega chad son of Sparta Virgil, the much less interesting Virgil who is literally just a plot device for Michonne's exit from the show. I mean, is there really much to talk about with him? He shows up, has a side quest with Michonne, turns out to be a pseudo antagonist and then they just poof. As I always say with these character exits, Denai Guerrera had been with the show for 7 years at that point and she just got better offers. So, you know, you gotta get that bag and there's not really much you can do there. If AMC wasn't willing to pay up, I mean, of course she left. So yes, Virgil has about as much depth as my sink. And I don't have a very deep sink. Okay, jokes aside, we'll touch on Virgil in the second half of the season as well, so don't worry about that now. Though a far more notable remix is absolutely everything we see on Daryl and Carol's side. Again, in the book, we don't have anything comparable to this whole search for the Horde or anything like that. So absolutely all of this is new across the board. That said, Carol runs after Alpha, everyone follows her, and they eventually fall into a cave. And yeah, this is something I have some very, very mixed thoughts on. 
I think the best way to summarize everything here is that Carol's character at this point is a slight remix on Rick's saying. That being, my wrath prevails over my common sense. I mean, yeah, I think it's incredibly dumb that not just her, but they all end up in this cave in the first place. Like, we have survived in the apocalypse for over a decade. We are in enemy territory, so now let's all run around like headless chickens. It's kind of like horror movie levels of convenience when it comes to the characters just making every single bad decision imaginable. Like, okay, don't get me wrong, Carol, okay, she's on a warpath, fine. But the rest of them just follow along with little to no thought. And then there's the whole dynamite debacle, which yes, does result in what is easily one of the greatest acted scenes in the show, but also, say it with me now, is dumb. First of all, remember how the dynamite Rosita and the others found was already wonky barely two years into the apocalypse? Well, now it's been over a decade. When left to the elements, dynamite begins to sort of sweat out nitroglycerin. So after 10 years, and don't get me wrong, I am not an explosive specialist, but I think the thermo shock alone would have made it blow up a long, long, long time ago. But number two, yes, Carol is on a warpath, but blowing up the whole thing with no care to what happens to the rest of them just seems out of character to me. Carol is certainly reckless, but she's not stupid and she's not going to put literally everyone else in danger. That said, I do think that the concept of a cave in the apocalypse is absolutely awesome and I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't absolutely horrifying. This is coming from someone who does not have the tiniest bit of claustrophobia. I've been to a few of these caves where you have to crawl through and stuff and I thought it was absolutely awesome. But like, the idea of being stuck in one of them, now that is a whole nother story. The sheer horror of just stumbling through this cave that is chock full of walkers in complete darkness with potentially no way out? Yikes. And oh boy, the shot of Daryl just dropping the torch into the darkness? Perfection. Also, as much as I think Carol's character is a bit all over the place, we do get some very neat attention to detail with her noting her claustrophobia. Which, if you're a fellow turbo nerd like me, you'll likely remember from way, 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 way back in the season 1 finale with them going up the elevator. Okay, but like for real, if Carol's nonsense got Jerry killed, I'd just straight up drop the show. Jokes aside, the cave then goes boom boom and we get to what is easily one of my favorite sequences in season 10. Connie and Megna of course end up trapped, so as the cave collapses, the rest of the group are clueless as to what happened to them. And this is where Norman, Melissa and Angel just all pop off. In a very, very rare show of completely raw emotion, Daryl just jumps on top of the pile and begins to hopelessly throw the rocks away one by one. While in the background, we just hear Kelly scream and cry. Just how utterly hopelessly the scene is framed with Aaron just calling to him as we zoom out to see the sheer size of the collapse. Daryl. Yet even then, Daryl just says, Help me! <laughs> and oh boy, then Carol comes into the picture and it's just perfect. The resentment on Daryl's face as Carol begs not for forgiveness but his blame with her just breaking down then and there. Oh please, you cared about her and now she's gone because of me, please just say it. It's like the perfect mirroring of the border sequence. Daryl was there to hold her back, to try to calm her down. Yet here, Carol is the one who caused this. And man, then those strings come in with Daryl just saying, Go home. Tell the others we found the Lord. Just how matter of fact and factual it is cuts so, so deep. It's not a tell them they're dead, tell them I went to search for them. No, it is literally just go home, tell them we found the horde. It's just so cold and I love it. If only any of it actually mattered, huh? I mean, yeah, when you boil all of it down, most of what happens here literally does not change absolutely anything, so it's kind of hard to really get that excited about. I guess it is the first explicit act of war, but then again, we've been in a cold war for a very, very long time already, so... Eh. If I had to summarize the entire cave mini story, I'd say it's a classic case of the show choosing style over substance. The idea is absolutely incredible, and it had many, many really, really cool moments. And the cast absolutely carries the story. But to me, it just seems very silly and again, misses the grit of the earlier seasons and the books. Like, as much as I joke about Jerry dying and me dropping the show, 
if someone, like seriously literally anyone, would have gotten crushed there, it would have at least been a reminder of what recklessness in the apocalypse results in. One misstep and someone dies. But no, because Carol was meant to be the protagonist and we were meant to sympathize with her, yes, she does something extremely stupid, but no, that cannot have consequences because she is on a hero's journey and we cannot have any bit of ambiguity whatsoever. It's exactly what I said before. Instead of Rick being just some guy making decisions and seeing where they land, the TV show at this point is the hero's journey. The main, main cast doesn't really make any hard calls anymore, and the brutality of the world that was once there is always disguised in, well, nothing bad happened, so clearly this was the right call. But anyway, out of fear of rambling on for 30 more minutes, that is where we'll leave it for today. With the remainder of Season 10, and obviously a overwhelming majority of Season 11, we will have a lot less of these somewhat uncanny direct comparisons where similar things happen but under completely different circumstances. So maybe there will even come a day where I don't spend 20 minutes rambling about the tone and thematic differences for half of the script. But yes, I say, in my opinion, and I think, a lot for a very good reason. So do let me know where you stand on all the big talking points we covered today. Do you think Carol's acting out of character, or do you think her warpath justifies all of it? Do you think the main characters very much lack agency? Do let me know. That said, next time we're finally delving into the Whisperer War proper and the many, many trials and tribulations there, with some even, unfortunately, transcending the show itself. And that's the video, and that is also officially all the pre-Whisperer War stuff wrapped up. So next time it's full steam ahead to the quite controversial volume that is the war. And oh boy, I scripted ahead and I'll tell you right now, Season 10 has at least a couple of warm videos worth of stuff to talk about, so we will be here for quite a while. And since you're still here, you might also be interested in some of the stuff I have going on on the second channel. I watched and talked quite a bit about the Rick and Daryl spin-off trailers, and I've also made a season review on Dead City. So if you're like mega bored, then feel free to give those a look, I guess. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Neon, Wolf Destiny 25 and Sophia Mirashidi? Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!